Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new Live Bytes Live session. Uh, I'm your host, Amir Grigic, and today I'm joined by uh, Reshad and uh, uh, Faris Zachina. They are uh, both the founders for Ministry of Programming, so I'm going to let them join the stream. Hello, guys. How are you? Hi, Amir. Thank you for, thank you for inviting us uh, to the show. We're very glad that we are, that we are together tonight. Yeah, very cool. Uh, we're going to talk all about building startups. Uh, and of course, uh, for the people that are uh, viewing us on uh, YouTube, on uh, Twitter, uh, please put in your questions for uh, Faris and uh, Rashad uh, if you have any questions about uh, the topics that we're going to discuss. But first, uh, maybe uh, one of you guys could just introduce yourselves and uh, tell a little bit about what you do with the uh, Ministry of Programming and, uh, and what your kind of day-to-day uh, -day is. Yeah, so I'm not going to introduce you know, ourselves individually, uh, like to not get into too, too much detail. We are software engineers, uh, designers, and we, we just got into, uh, you know, uh, into this business uh, of building startups gradually by first being uh, working for other people and building innovative products. But then we decided that we should deploy this knowledge and uh, accumulated experience into building a company that builds new companies, which is uh, usually called Venture Builder. And the uh, Ministry of Programming is basically that. It's, uh, it's a Venture Builder that's focused on building early stage uh, startups. And uh, how do we do that is that we, uh, we are focusing on three components. One is, uh, you know, team formation and assembling, uh, you know, startup teams, product teams. Uh, another area that we focus on is pre-seed investments in startups, uh, and then a third area is also one, uh, you know, like an, like a mentorship and acceleration model, how to help founders get connected to uh, to investors, how to be uh, a good support structure for founders to survive long term, to thrive, to build successful startups. Uh, so yeah, now we have 100 people, uh, approximately 100 employees. The company was founded in 2015, and uh, yeah, we, we we mostly focus on fintech and health tech startups. But then we we love the challenge to work also on some new stuff that we understand even in other verticals. So yeah, so that's shortly about us and, and about MVP. Very cool. I mean, uh, it's it's a big leap, of course, from uh, starting just uh, five years ago and then being with a hundred people in uh, in that short of a time, of course. And I mean, that also brings us to the first topic that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, and that's uh, if you're starting a startup, right? Where do you start? Um, maybe uh, you can give some insights to the things that you've seen over the over the last few years. Yeah. So. Um... I mean, I, I personally think that there is uh, no like formula or uh, specific, let's say, blueprint that you can follow into building a new company or startup, right? And uh, whoever tells you that, um, it's, that person is not right. So, so I think it's it's very individual, and uh, you need to see what works for you, what works for your company. So, uh, obviously, there are some things that we have seen. Uh, through our journey as some some best practices. We have been involved in more than 50 startups in, in, uh, in our careers, and we have seen a lot. Obviously, we failed a lot, and based on those failures, we have started to recognize some patterns. But uh, I don't think that anyone in the world right now has figured out the exact formula. So that's why there is still this infamous, let's say, ratio of, uh, of the uh, failure versus success for startups which is some people say it's nine, uh, nine fail out of 10, right? So, mm -hmm. so this infamous ratio and, and uh, the, the formula just doesn't exist. But, but maybe, I mean, we can tell about some, 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 best, some best practices that we have noticed. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have a topic about the successful startups, of course. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, for sure, uh, just share your, your opinions on just some of the things that you've seen, like uh, that didn't work or uh, also how people like really started, right? So say, for yeah. instance, you have an idea and uh, you want to go from there, right? Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly how most people think about startups and how they get into, uh, you know, building their own startup. They have an idea, 
um, they usually have, I mean, mostly technical people have a really clear product idea, while maybe business people have some sort of business model or solution to, to some market issue. Uh, and I think, uh, but I think that it's very important that a founder understands the problem space very well and uh, who is the customer, uh, what are the needs of the customer, what are the burning problems, the pain points, and then uh, also like what is the larger market context, what, who is the buyer, how much can they can pay, what is the size of the market. And I think these kind of things are not really natural. We see that a lot of people are struggling with quantifying these things. They have a good idea, maybe they have some sort of solution or product in mind, but they don't really know uh, who's going to buy that for what price, etc. And uh, I think that the best founders that we work with, uh, for example, the founders of Naga, for example, and other companies we built, uh, are, are people that are really obsessed to solve a very specific customer problem. And they're really annoyed by the current alternatives in the market. And then they're really, they're really like burning to solve this problem. And uh, they, they're ready for the long-term game. They're not uh, afraid to stay in for five, 10, 15 years in the game. Yeah, exactly. Because like it starts from first from solving a, a real life problem and, and you need to find something that, that is worth solving. I mean, if you're building, let's say a copycat of an existing idea, then of course your chances for success are much, much different. And you start from a genuine, genuine idea. You start from a genuine need of, of a specific group of people. And usually that group of people is very niche, is very small. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you just go, go there and solve their problem, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's as easy as that. And a lot of people think like, like about some big stuff, uh, but, uh, but generally I think it's about staying as small as possible with the scope. I mean, I yeah. And when you, when you look at that, when you are in those uh, kind of starting phases, is it, um, what do you feel is more, a lot of people, uh, especially the tech people will start to think about what kind of tech stack can I use, right? Or they will think about like, okay, I want to build this product. I, I'm going to use this and this uh, technology, and this is going to be a success just because of that, right? Just because of the technology itself. So how, how do you view that? I think it's, uh, it's. I mean, it's exactly what happens with developers. I mean, we 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 were exactly we were thinking the same. Maybe I don't know, six seven years ago. But I think that now we understand that technology is just an enabler of a larger business model. And I think what's what's important to understand is that uh, you know you can have the greatest technology in the world and the best code, but if there's there is nobody that wants the product that has a need for it, is going to pay for it that technology is going to fail. So over time, we started thinking that uh, technology and design is uh, are just steps in a larger process. And then uh, technology is, is definitely important. It's very important what, uh, what do you choose to work with? What is, the, what is on the front end? What is on the back end? What is the infrastructure? But it shouldn't be the core focus of the team. It's, it's just one of the things you need to think about. And we can talk about that in more detail, but it's, I definitely agree. I think a lot of people really start by just coding and then they don't really think about everything else like marketing and sales and uh, recruitment and fundraising and all of these problems that are key to, to, to achieve success. So, so I think, uh, yeah, so, so I think as, as, ex, as ex programmers, we can definitely give advice that, you know, if you are good at something, Make sure that you team up with somebody that complements also your your gaps, your uh, you know your weaknesses, and that can help you uh, with uh, with doing the things that you don't like. So if you are a programmer, find a good marketer or a salesperson that can help you as a co-founder, and then it's much easier to to launch something successful. Exactly, and, and in history, it was always like a combination of those two worlds, and you know you need somebody that is really good at selling and somebody that is really good at. And, uh, technology so uh, building so so um i mean if you're trying to build like the best architecture for your software right away or you know pe people think think like okay I i'm going to spin this new idea and uh, my ar architecture needs to be perfect because what if i scale to 1 million users or if i have <laughs> yeah. 50 thousand users out the door, out the door right yeah. so i mean so if you have that problem that's really good for you but uh, but uh, unfortunately <laughs> A lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, us don't don't get uh, into that sweet spot. And if you if you if you get there, 
uh, then you know I, I'm pretty sure that you will solve it. But you should definitely not go for perfection right away. Yeah, and that's something that I've noticed when building a product as well. Is uh, we we tend to look at the things like okay, this is the product. This is how we're going to solve it technologically, and uh, we can get up to that point, right? But on the other hand, you you have to have some kind of business plan, right? Some kind of way that you're going to put this product into the market. Like, what are some of the use, unique selling points that you have uh, that can actually propel you into that kind of thing and what you mentioned about the the kind of scaling to a billion or a million users or something like that there's a saying i uh, i often use uh, in in teams that i'm in uh, and i always say like you're not google right you're not going <laughs> let's let's be honest here you're not, the, the the chances of you being so successful like a google or or uh, or a facebook or whatever it is uh, it it's just really small right As, especially if you're a startup if you're just starting out uh, you can think about like okay how am i going to scale this application uh, something like that but it isn't uh, that's not the the thing you should be starting with right you should should be starting like okay, I have this idea. I think this product is going to be X, Y, and Z. And I want to see how many people are interested in this. So what are some of the things you would uh, would suggest to people to to use to see if their kind of idea or their product uh, may work in the, in, uh, in the near future? I think to go, to go back to your point, yeah. is, uh, I mean, in terms of go to market, I mean, if you are developing any product, uh, if it's a B2B product, a really good mentality is, how do you get to the first 10 or maybe 100 customers, but usually a lower number is really good. I mean, like even five or 10 customers. And then think about marketing and sales and even technology in that, in that in, inside those constraints. If you are a B2C product, then uh, usually I think like 100 or 1,000 you know, is a really good number to start with. And then how do you reach the first 100 or the first 1,000 customers? And then I think that like really... Uh, puts you inside a box, which is really useful for, these are the type of constraints that also, you know, uh, help the team think more pragmatically. And then the team is going to think about technology, about marketing, about everything in a very different way. And, uh, and this is how any good company is built from the first thousand people that love your product, they recommend it to other people. And I think it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, how people think about startups usually, they, they think about hyper growth, and, uh, but actually, if you look at stories of startups, even from, uh, from our startups, I mean, it takes a lot of time to get to traction for the average startup, not for the outliers. So I think it's, uh, you know, thinking about the first 10, 100, 1,000 customers is a very practical advice. And then uh, later on, when you, when you see traction, when you see that you are scaling, then okay, I mean, you can build a nice architecture and, you know, and you can kind of expand. Yeah, because yeah. people, people, like very often start from, from let's say, from uh, ads right away. Uh, I, I don't know, you build like a product for, uh, for car enthusiasts, let's say, right? And what people do is they, they throw some money right away on, on Google ads or Facebook ads or whatever. And th that's, that's the way that they are trying to reach the customer. As, uh, as, as a more successful approach uh, uh, in line with what Faris said, is to actually uh, go in there, you know, go into, into your local uh, automotive club, you know, go into the uh, car dealer shop, you know, go, go, go where those people are and try to onboard as many people as possible in the beginning. So, so build that, that small community that, you know, uh, 10, 10, 20, 50 people that are going to support your product, that are going to be like uh, that force that is uh, kind of attracting more, more, more customers. Uh, into yeah. The platform. yeah. I agree totally. So we have our first question, uh, and let's uh, do that uh, one as well. Because you're in Bosnia, uh, for people that don't know, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Almir Mekic has a question about what do you think about the Bosnian market and where we'll be in the next five years. I think that's in, in general in terms of the startup community. Uh, so uh, maybe you guys can share your light on that. Yeah, so I mean, so we are acting as a global player, so we are not confined just to, just to one market, so we work all over the world. Uh, in terms of the Bosnian market, uh, I think that the whole, uh, whole ex-Yugoslavia region, let's say, is developing very fast. Uh, there is a lot of talent. Uh, the problem that we have here in this region is uh, access to capital. So we have a lot of talent, but the problem is the access to capital. So that means when somebody spins a new idea or a new startup, uh, there is uh, 
there are not a lot of people that will actually help you financially. But uh, I think that you always need to look at the upside and what you can achieve in a specific market. So the upside that we have and uh, the, let's say, the advantage that we have in these markets is that there are a lot of talented people. So you don't have, let's say, you don't have the same problems that people have, let's say, in Berlin. But uh, but you have another problem is, is that, that you don't have necessarily money. But, uh, you know, I mean, usually a lot of those things are interconnected. So you should look at what you can use in the, in the place where, where you are. You should activate as many as many people as possible to help you and maybe capital and look for capital elsewhere. Also, the problem is there are not enough mentors, I think, and uh, also structures like accelerators and uh, incubators, etc. But that's that's uh, really changing now. I think in the next five years, we're going to see a shift. We're going to see much more accelerators, incubators, VCs. We already observe that many, many people are entering these markets, especially in Serbia and uh, also in Slovenia. And we can see a lot of movement. So I think uh, it's going to come to Bosnia as well. Um, and uh, I think it's just, just a matter of time. I think five years is a big period of time and we're going to see a lot of change. I think also we need a mentality shift because these parts of the world are used to do outsourcing. And, uh, you know, we do it really well historically. Uh, but then people need to shift into this idea of building products and building equity and building wealth through building companies, uh, which is basically entrepreneurship. And then I think uh, fr from the perspective of the education system, we need more entrepreneurial entrepreneurship education in these parts of the world. And I see all of this as opportunities. So we know a lot of companies and a lot of global accelerators and VCs that are just waiting for the right moment to get into the Balkan market. Uh, and they just want to see good founders with good ideas. They want to see success stories. Uh, and uh, you can you can find a lot of these in, for example, in Serbia, in Slovenia, much bigger than people think. So I think uh, there will be a moment when when this explodes. I hope I hope so. Yeah, I think so too. And I uh, I know the Serbian market a little bit because we uh, we outsource there, uh, and uh, it, you see that uh, you see like whole cities just running on IT, right? Just running on basically on the IT industry, uh, and of course from that will come. Uh, companies that will also build their own products, uh, see like a uh, business need or something that can be solved and just go into that space as well. So uh, I see another question uh, and I think it's an interesting one. Uh, so is it harder to build a successful startup today uh, versus, I think it's versus five years ago. Uh, and I think it's in general, right? It, it doesn't really matter just for Bosnia, but I think it's uh, interesting to see uh, to see that. I'm going to open and then Rashad can continue. But I think yeah. today is uh, it's much easier to build a startup. I mean, obviously it depends where you are, but I think it's much easier in general for one simple reason is that, uh, I mean, after, after the, the development of the internet and the communication technologies and uh, the learning resources, it's much easier to learn how to build a startup now than, I don't know, 10 years ago. Before it was like really like a very closed system uh, for many people. So today you have a lot of information about how to build a company, how to build a startup. But also uh, technology became a commodity. It's much cheaper. Uh, so even to, to spin a decent startup that has like decent traction is much, much cheaper today than, I don't know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, so kind of the accessibility to build new companies is much easier. For example, now you can open a company in the U.S., by clicking online, you don't need to even to, maybe you, you, will, you will never visit the US, but you can open an LLC or a C Corp in the US online. And a lot of these things uh, enable entrepreneurship. And I think that's maybe the first part of the answer. Yeah, I think it's a good one. Like, uh, I, I mean, I also think it's, it's always a good time. Like the problems change, right? So, so uh, also, I mean, there are different problems that, that, that were existent five years ago and new problems that exist today. We also see it in this COVID situation. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people are taking advantage of, uh, of the crisis and you, you can see that especially in the startup community, uh, people are much more resilient than, uh, than, than, than corporations. Why? Because they see an opportunity and then they pivot, they, they try to figure out like an angle where they can attack, where they change or add additional features into an existing application or so I think it's 
um, you know, it's it's a world of chance, and it's it's uh, in in my opinion, it's always a good time. Yeah, and they can adapt faster, as you said. If you're in a smaller team or you're a smaller group, uh, you can adapt uh, to just the changes that you have. Like, if there is a change today, like uh, an extreme change, you can actually see, like, okay, uh, we're there. Uh, guys get together, or guys or girls get together, and then let's get to get to a solution in that sense. So I, I feel like when you what you said about the te technology is really accessible right now, right? I mean, if you want to learn how to code, you can learn how to code. You just need to be to to want that, right? You need to want to get to 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 that level that you can build your own product and build your own things. Uh, and then from there, as you said, the mentorship comes in, right? It, you need someone that can help you out at least in some kind of uh, advice kind of way like okay someone that has done it before they can help you out in the in the kind of business sense or find someone that has that knack for uh, business more than you have in that sense so i i feel like uh if if i'm if i'm looking at this question i would say that it's for sure easier actually than to build it uh, but on the other hand uh, you have a lot more competition nowadays than you had 5 years ago so those are kind of the it's it's you can you can say harder and easier at the same time on this question i think I mean, it also depends where you are if you are absolutely you, are yeah. in, uh, um, you know maybe it makes sense to provide uh, even basic needs to people like having access to um, electric power right so yeah. well, you can build like a solar device uh, that is collecting solar energy and then people have maybe electric electric power but but you know in some other markets you need much more advanced ideas and generally as you go more west then, as you said, it's much more complex because there is more competition. But uh, as yeah. you go, say, uh, more more east and south, then then uh, you have more basic problems that have been solved maybe elsewhere, and yeah. where you add another angle. And then also you have cultural differences in every country. You have different needs, and people approach things from approach things in different ways because of beliefs, of tradition or or culture, etc. Also yeah. buying power, and I think also one opportunity is there's always like a local opportunity, as Rashad said, everywhere, not only in Africa, but also on a city level, on a community level. And then I think people uh, should not think about startups in terms of the VC mantra of building like huge companies. I mean, building a startup sometimes means creating a lifestyle or just like building a sustainable revenue for yourself to be, you know, maybe you employ just a few people, maybe you are self-employed, it doesn't really matter. And I think uh, if you look at startups as, as a very flexible thing, then there are opportunities everywhere. But if you look at startups as a maximalistic model to build in the next Facebook, then uh, obviously it's very hard. And uh, it depends what's your mentality. Yeah, good luck finding a unique idea in the Netherlands. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's going to be really uh, tough. So... Uh, but uh, let's go into the next topic. I think it's uh, interesting uh, to 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 look at that, and that's kind of bootstrap versus VC, right? So uh, if, when you're starting out, you need, of course, the financial picture as well. You need to be able to sustain yourself and uh, build out your your product and your your company. Um, so, uh, what are your kind of um, experiences with do you have experiences with both or do you have more with one than the other how, how have you seen it over the last few years yeah we do have experience with both so uh, so i think i think i mean that those are basically two different approaches like the first one is uh, finding uh, external capital so venture capital through uh, an angel investment network or institutional vcs or uh, you know and the, the other approach is basically bootstrapping a uh, startup on your own, or to, make, to put it in, in easier words, to finance it with your own funds or the funds of the, let's say, founding team that is, uh, that is building a product. Mm. And um, I think, um, I mean, in the Western world, the prevalent, uh, like, I mean, in general, let's say in the startup world, uh, it, was, it was mostly about, uh, about the VC, Way, right so it was about finding somebody that would invest in your startup and that would make you uh, that, that would accelerate your growth in a way right but uh, as well I mean you have a lot of examples of really successful companies uh, that were bootstrapped so uh, one example is for example Mailchimp um, one of the uh, biggest uh, products in the, in the mailing space 
Um, and um, you know, it's it's a great and relevant company, and it was complete. It was bootstrapped, right? And you have many many examples uh, like like Mailchimp, uh, but but I think I mean there is no right or or or, or let's say wrong way. Uh, you know, with with uh, VC funding, you can definitely uh, accelerate growth much faster in most instances because um, I mean we see that people when they get some external funds, uh, you know, they have a funding round, they get I don't know one million, uh, then they are able to hire very quickly, they're able to scale the team, they're able to scale the marketing, uh, they can uh, they can bump the marketing budgets, they throw more money on Facebook ads. Uh, they can do much more things, but that is also dangerous at the same time, right? Because uh, as you grow quickly, then it's harder to control the company, right? So, uh, I mean, my preference personally is bootstrapped, and I think uh, that's much more natural. But again, I see the, uh, I see the, let's say, advantages of, of taking external capital because you most likely are not going to have one million or a couple of million to fund and um, sometimes when that money comes in, it allows you to, to, to grow really quickly. But, uh, yeah. Maybe. But I also think it's, I mean, it depends. Uh, for example, I agree that bootstrapping is the right way to go. I mean, for most people, you know, most people think about VC funding. Um, as we discussed in the technology section, um, actually technology is so cheap now uh, that if you are pragmatic enough and if you constrain, <clears throat> you're constrain yourself to build a really minim minimum viable product, let's say, you, you put an artificial uh, constraint. You say, I have six weeks to build something. Uh, and uh, then you, you plan to launch it in six weeks. And this is usually how we work on MVPs. Uh, then it's not really a big cost. You can definitely uh, fund that. You can find the money for that. But actually how most people start startups is that they put together like a big list of features. And then uh, it's usually like a six month or 12 month or 18 month iteration for developing that. So I think instead of that, it's much better to constrain yourself, say, okay, I have six weeks or eight weeks to, to develop and launch something, and then you can definitely bootstrap. And I think, I mean, uh, but I mean, to go back to the larger point, uh, I mean, people look at fundraising as the inception point of a company, but that's not the inception point. The inception point of a company is the founders solving a really significant customer problem and then creating a great company that serves customers with minimum, minimal resources. And uh, I think that if you are able to do that, then later on you can decide to take VC money or you know to, to accelerate growth when you have traction. And at that point, I think the company is more valuable. Uh, you have a larger percent of your company because you know you are selling at a higher valuation. And uh, I think that's that's the right mindset to have. You know, it's not and I think a lot of people are blocked by this idea that they need one million to start a company or you know, they need to find an angel investor. No, man, just just put constraints. Six weeks, small team, small ambition, find, you know, 10, 100, 1,000 customers, and then you can really finance it by, uh, you know, by bootstrapping. Yeah, I mean, a very good example is that's even Instagram, right? Uh, I don't know how many people they had before they were acquired by Facebook. Uh, they had maybe, I don't know, like, uh, I, I think it was... In the dozens. Uh, yeah, in the dozens. They just had, like, uh, maybe... Uh, seven, seven to twenty people max, and you know, can you imagine that a company like that was acquired for for one billion, right? So, so yeah. it's not about it's not about being big or or about you know uh, having the most money in the bank. It's about providing value and having like the smallest team possible, the minimal resources to to build something great and something that people want. Yeah, and I think if you're if you're picking between those these two, it's also good to look at like how many, uh, how much influence ha has someone over you, right? If if you're uh, taking VC money, you are essentially giving up a part of your company in most cases, right? You're essentially giving up uh, a percentage of your company to that particular VC, uh, which also means like uh, if there are some kind of things that you want to go through, you want to you want to have a particular direction, uh, say for instance, you need to pivot or something like that, you also need to have that 
go through the VC as well. Like, uh, what do you th- guys think of this and uh, stuff like that? Uh, and even maybe you do you want to invest in that pivot or or not and and stuff like that. So it it's also a, a question of how much influence do you want from the outside on in the beginning. I think uh, if you were starting up, uh, I can imagine that you maybe don't want that influence like right away, but maybe later on when you see like okay, I'm hitting a wall now. I need to have access to new markets or something like that. Then you can think about it, right? Yeah, I mean, w- w- when you bring investors on board, one of the, of the most important things is actually to look at what what kind of value are those people bringing into the startup. So it's not just about somebody handing you some money. It's about what they are bringing to the table. And the most uh, successful entrepreneurs that we know are actually the ones that are very selective on who they take the money from. And it's, Absolutely. you know, and like, for example, uh, one investor can bring you uh, a lot of good connections in a specific industry, or they can bring uh, I don't know some some even personal value to, to the startup. Maybe they are uh, an avid cyclist, and you are building like a, a bike b- biking startup or whatever. And then you you bring on board like a really avid cyclist that knows a lot about that domain and that can bring you bring you even, even some uh, uh, besides money much more things to the table. So this is a really important point because. Um, a lot of founders just go for the money and that's that's really wrong because then as you said you bring in people that are going to sit with you at the table and that that you not necessarily like <laughs> and that's that they will be asked uh, about uh, many matters which uh, which makes it harder to definitely drive the ship but also i mean if we look at the evolution of vc i mean we see that i mean historically uh, vcs were just deploying money and uh, then like acting as a networking structure to connect founders with good opportunities. Um, but now I think also VCs are evolving. We see a lot of VCs that are uh, thinking in terms to, to really serve the entrepreneurs. I think there is a trend around that. Also like VCs that are not taking taking board seats or they are not really controlling the founder. One example, I think it's tiny VC and I mean, similar yep. VCs that are operating in a very different way than before. So I think even in, in the VC space, there's a lot of difference and a lot of fragmentation and, or, and segmentation in terms of how people operate. Uh, but I mean, our, our ethos as a company, for example, how we invest is that we are not really acting as a VC, we are more acting as almost like, a, like an angel uh, investment structure because we, we see ourselves as somebody that is in service of the founders. We should help them. We are not like you know there just to deploy capital. So instead, we are there to really support long term the companies we work with. And I think uh, and that and that's that's why maybe we like more the bootstrapping and angel investment angle than the VC angle. Even though we understand the value of VC, I mean, for high growth, for sure, specific yeah. verticals where you need a lot of money to succeed, where you need to deploy capital to like to roll out your service globally or product. I think it makes a lot of sense for some. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you cannot bootstrap ever, bootstrap everything. So it's, no, it's no. And well, I think there's <laughs> there's a good question about that one as well. Because how do you uh, how do you find promising startups to work with? Because you're you're in that position where you also look at startups like, okay, how can we work with them or how can we help them out? So how do you how do you do that? So we personally, uh, and as a company, we, we don't we don't find them in the traditional ways. We find them basically through the network. So we find them through the people that we know, and by helping a lot of entrepreneurs uh, being better and, and having more success, then usually people come to us. So um, uh, obviously, we are present in, in the bigger startup ecosystems, and and that's where we meet a lot of interesting people, and then. Uh, one thing leads to the other very easy yeah i think that's how any um, you know any good company is built i mean even a vc for example if you want to build a vc firm or an accelerator or any company or a startup i mean you the, the best way to grow is by helping a single customer and then that customer is going to refer you to the next customer and this is this is really how anything grows that is really valuable uh, yeah. Maybe the acceleration is so big that people don't see these micro steps where people are inviting other people to use the same product or service. And this is how we were growing as well, like one by one and uh, onboarding one, one client, one 
customer one founder helping them then the next one is referred by the first one and then it really starts growing quickly but then at some point you need to really uh, i mean now we have 100 people we are approaching uh, you know like a very significant you know uh, you know level of revenue on a yearly level and now i think we need to um, obviously we are working to grow our marketing and sales channels more deliberately uh, but i think you can grow for a long time as a company, as a startup, without any, uh, you know, if, if you have like a really good product and service, if you are serving your customer, if you are literally loving uh, the problem that you are uh, solving and, and talking to people and improving every day, I think you can grow organically for a very long time. And then, and then when you need, you start like deploying marketing and sales budgets, you know, employing people and growing much faster and then looking for your customers, where are they and how can we get to them Excellent. Yeah, I mean, the, the gist is like, like with everything else in life, if, if you are valuable and if somebody finds your work valuable, then people are going to find you, right? So um, let, let's say you can buy a lot of traffic via ads or, you know, via, let's say, some digital marketing techniques, but eventually uh, the best way to grow is by, by, by doing really good work. In any yeah. of so if you have a really good... Um, I don't know, car shop for car repairs, uh, people are going are gonna to hear about it, right? And then somebody's going to tell you, hey, I service my car there, you should go there. People are going to go there. So word of mouth, networks, and that's community. That's, community, that's what works best. And I think, unfortunately, because for your point, Amr, you said there's a lot of competition, you know, like if you look at the market yeah. channels right now, it's so saturated. And then when even if you do things like paid advertisement or if you do things like you know anything on social media or you know like if you if you do everything else everything that everybody is doing away then, then you're really constrained and uh, you don't have enough money to compete with much bigger players uh, you know the costs of doing traditional marketing and sales is, is very high and then I think uh, this is what this is why it's even more important today to do like community management you know uh, to work uh, on your brand, but locally, like like to, 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 to look at micro opportunities, pockets of opportunities where you can get in and lock down a, a small number of customers and then how can you grow from that niche, from that from that small pocket into a larger group of customers? Yeah, and there was there was one question about uh, marketing activities as well, and I think that's good to uh, to address now as well. So um, uh, there's a question about what kind of marketing activities would you recommend for a tech startup focused on big corporations to get brand awareness, and what's your opinion on LinkedIn ads uh, targeting in this sense? So uh, maybe you guys can uh, can give your opinion on that one. I think I mean. Uh, again, it depends on, on the exact context, so it's, it's very hard to, to answer questions like without knowing what is the startup doing. What it's really broad, they... yeah. I think, for example, LinkedIn ads, we've seen that people are really successful with this approach also because LinkedIn is a really uh, underutilized channel in general. And uh, then there is this problem of uh, channel satur saturation over time. For example, like, I don't know, Facebook was really a good channel maybe 10 years ago, and uh, but today, yeah is like super saturated. Also like Instagram is the same. Uh, so for example, LinkedIn and TikTok are much less saturated today than, than many other channels. And this is why I think LinkedIn makes sense for many companies. Uh, obviously for this case of uh, startups focused on big corporations, I mean, depending on what you do, maybe you can even use TikTok. I mean, we, we are building now one startup for performance marketing on TikTok and similar platforms. So uh, we see a lot of big brands that are deploying big budgets to get exposed to an audience through video uh, and through these rich media formats. And uh, I think it's definitely a, the, the modern way of uh, marketing and selling. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think LinkedIn is a great uh, option, but there are many other activities you can do. I think one thing that we were doing over these years is mapping out all of the possible methods that you can use in marketing, in product, you know, in design, and then I can tell you, I mean, if I, if I showed you a list of the checklists and the full list of all marketing techniques and channels, it's crazy. It's like overwhelming. And I think it's, uh, in the end, uh, the best way to go is to experiment with different channels uh, with small budgets, measure and see what works. Uh, and then, you know, like, and then over time, it's almost like A, B, C, D testing, where you are testing different channels, different ideas. And then when you figure out what works, it could be LinkedIn. 
then you like deploy much more cash into that channel and uh, uh, yeah but again i mean the same advice applies to these startups as with other startups as we said one customer by one customer get 10 customers first 100 then thousand you know don't go like with paid marketing right away because you're just wasting money you don't know your customer well enough first collect feedback understand your customer what problems they have what are the what is their buying power and make sure that you have like a really good product and service and then start deploying money into paid marketing yeah I agree totally. I mean, uh, when you look at uh, some other things that are very important in this as well is just your personal branding as well, right? If you're a founder, for example, uh, if people are already following you because of your kind of the ideas that you have, just the ideas about the business and uh, how you market yourself, you will also see that it uh, it helps, right? It helps in just when you have that product. For, for example, the, the best example, I think, is uh, when you look at Basecamp, right? When you look at the guys from Basecamp, they just launched that uh, hate dot com uh, thing uh, that they got immense amount of users just because their kind of personal branding their uh, branding how they've done it through Basecamp of course it's an extreme example they have a, have a have a big following but you can see what that does right if you have that big of a following you can can do all kinds of things and and also the the feud they had with Apple and stuff like that I I kind of uh, look at that from from uh, just from the sidelines, and you're like, okay, you can see what a following does to uh, uh, the success of a startup, or however where you want to call it. So, uh, so I think, uh, as you said, I think it's good to uh, not focus directly on putting a lot of money into marketing and hoping that uh, it will stick, especially if you don't know the exact people that you're targeting, the people that you want to to get to. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna tell like a funny story. Uh, from uh, like what happened in the US, in one of the startups that we that we were part of, uh, before we joined, like you know, there was the startup was based in Miami, and and basically uh, they they wanted to do like some marketing push to to acquire more users, uh, and uh, the idea was to to fly with a small with a small plane over the beach and to throw the flyers, you know, on the beach, and then everybody would get your QR code. They would download the app and everything, you know. But uh, the thing is, you know, like um, it turned out that I mean, they found examples about this this exact idea before in some startups that failed, and and then they decided to, to not go for it because that's that's a great example of a huge waste of money because mm. like, how many people are going to convert on the beach with some random flyer that flew like on their lap, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But, you know, I mean, you need to be like very aware of what you're doing and what people are proposing you and not everything that you read in books or that you find online is going to help you. So so I think it's about simple things and about figuring out what works for you. Exactly. So uh, let's get into the next kind of topic. Uh, so resiliency. I think a lot of startups, uh, of course, when you're strapped for cash, especially in the beginning, uh, it's hard to kind of keep your resiliency and work through a crisis if there is a crisis like we have uh, right now. Um, so how do you how do you view that? So I know that, for example, your company uh, has go been go going through this crisis pretty well, actually, in terms of uh, when you kind of compare it to other companies. So how do you how do you see that? How do you see kind of startup resiliency? What are some of the things that you would uh, you see are are working right now? I mean, I mean, it's not that we, we figured out like the crisis uh, solutions. I mean, we no. we some multiple crises actually. Uh, because exactly because of our of our business model and how we work, because we work exclusively with startups, and then of course, you know, you run you run into all kinds of issues by working with startups because those people don't have money. So whoever thinks it's that it's a great idea to, uh, to to do what we do, I mean, it's it's really tough. It's it's very interesting, but <laughs> it's tough, you know. And you run into a lot of small crises along the way, right? And every founder does. So uh, you have heard a lot of stories where, where people have just like hundred dollars in their bank account. And they're figuring how to make make something work. So I think that as entrepreneurs, we we, we through time we figure out uh, what are the best ways to do things. So uh, what I would definitely uh, say to um, like as an advice is to to be very aware of how you grow, and you know and uh, back to my point about VC funding. You know you should never. Uh, spend the money and hire as many people as possible in a specific moment. So you need to be 
uh, very aware of roads. So that's where sometimes even having, uh, let's say, some consultants uh, is good, right? Because I mean, now there is because then you know you can you can cut costs by cutting consultants and not the employees. So that's you know like uh, there are many techniques where you can overcome uh, a crisis by by being smart first on how you employ people. Also, of course, the diversification of uh, of uh, your sales channels and the diversification of the portfolio. So whatever you are selling or whatever service you are providing, you should have as many customers as possible from different domains. You should not rely only on one channel or only on one customer. Also, like <clears throat> I think one thing that we did really well uh, is that we, we really understood, I mean, when we had the first crisis in our company uh, last year, 2019, beginning of 2019, we understood that that's an opportunity to improve. Uh, there is this quote, never waste a crisis, but we'll, we like more the concept of anti-fragility from uh, Nassim Taleb. And uh, what it means is that every blow, every hit, every crisis is an opportunity to get better, not to just survive. I mean, it's not about surviving. It's about under understanding what caused the crisis, uh, how does it affect your company, and then uh, how can you optimize and improve over time. And one of the things that we were doing, for example, that's really important is obviously building up the runway, uh, building up the cash position of the company so you can survive for a longer period, period of time, even if you lose all, all of your revenue streams or most of your revenue streams. Uh, also, like differentiation of revenue streams, as Rashad was saying, I mean, don't rely on one customer or even, you know, even a few. I mean, just make sure that you have enough distribution so you can take any blow. Um, and then uh, many things like that also. One, one thing that's understated in these situations is the mentality of the founders and the, the owners of the companies. Uh, so it's very important that you have the right attitude uh, and that you think long term. And for example, me and Rashad, when a crisis hit like last year and also this year, uh, we were always thinking, OK, we are ready to lose money. We are ready to you know, even scale down for a bit. But the mission is the same. It's a long term game. You know, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that we keep the people motivated, that we like strive to not uh, fire anyone just like that. So we need to, to, to like keep going, keep motivation high. We're going to take the blow as founders, you know, so literally, but stay really positive in these situations, have a long term attitude and work much harder in a crisis than usual. And then I think, uh, you know, that, that's exactly what we did during the coronavirus. We literally prepared for something that would be much, much larger than, than what everybody was talking about. We were talking about 2021, 2022 uh, being like really bad years. And then we started thinking in, in terms of what do we need to do to prepare for that? And I think, I think uh, even in this crisis, what we should do collectively is to prepare for the next one after, after this, because everything in the economy is cyclic. So we cannot guarantee that uh, things will go up. I think that anybody that believes in endless growth without uh, failing occasionally or going down occasionally, I think uh, is a fool. And what we realized is that, you know, that in every crisis, uh, a crisis is expected every few years for any company, for any business. And I think it's normal. Yeah. And I mean, you can see like both startups that are pivoting into different ideas, into different fields that are changing uh, business models, that are finding different ways to, to get the customer. You know, in this crisis, uh, it's 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 a great opportunity to, uh, as far as said, to to like to lean up, and to see what you can do to be better the next time. So, I mean, we see that the the successful people right now are the ones that are uh, that have not been digital, but now are going digital. Uh, the successful people now uh, are the ones that you know that are changing, as I said, the business models, but also the people. I mean, the people that are working in the startups, they need to acquire new knowledge. They need to to upgrade themselves, you know, like they need to maybe figure out some additional tools, some additional ways to do things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think it's good to uh, to touch on another topic. So that's technology and technology and development. I didn't have that uh, have this on the uh, initial kind of topics list, but I see a lot of questions about it. So I think that we can pick up some questions and uh, do this topic as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one uh, question about how do you pick a right technology for a startup? Well. I can I can probably answer this one for you guys as well. It, it it really it really depends. I mean, it really depends on what kind of startup you're building, what kind of product you're building, 
if you're looking at the product itself, uh, if you have a product that uh, needs to be searchable really fast, right, and it has a lot of has a lot of data in it, you will pick a different technology than you will pick a different than a technology in in another sense. So, how to pick it is uh, pretty much up to the p- persons building it, uh, but also uh, it's just. It depends on what you're building. So if you're building a very big data-driven thing, uh, you're going to go for something, uh, pick a pick a particular database that's easily searchable, stuff like that. For example, Elasticsearch or something like that. You're you're going to pick something that's that's pretty good for that particular thing. So uh, how to pick the right technology? I mean, this is a question I think uh, we we get uh, you get on a daily basis probably but uh, it it is uh, just it depends it, uh, it it depends really on what you want what you're building i think i don't know if you have anything to add to that one but yeah, you explained very well i would not add, add anything to it i think it's it's the proper answer so you just look at the use case and yeah yeah things. and uh, the, there's a more like a cliche answer which is uh, use whatever you are familiar with um and uh, coming back to my point from before i mean if you put some really good constraints on, on your startup. Uh, for example, if you say we need to launch in six weeks or eight weeks, and we don't have any more time than this, we need to cut the feature set to these essential features that are solving the most painful customer problems. Yeah. And then uh, you throw out everything from, from the list, and you postpone for version two. Yeah. And then I think that helps you determine the context much better. You also, not thinking about scalability initially, unless you are building a very specific product uh, in a specific market that maybe requires that, uh, it's very important. Uh, I think familiarity is important. I mean, we, we also, as a company, we initially we have been from 2015 and 16, we have been promoting this idea of uh, using rapid development technologies like you know, Node.js and the similar technologies that at that time compared to Java or .NET or other tech was much faster to develop, to develop with and you could find more easily, you could recruit people more easily for those technologies. Um, and uh, I think it was, a, it was a decent idea also because it was based on, on the concept of, you know, develop technology that is, uh, you're not gonna have to rewrite uh, completely over time as well. And, um, and uh, that is also efficient at, at IO, input output operations, because most of the stuff that you develop in modern systems are integrations, database, you know, connect, database, uh, you know, yeah, uh, and, uh, and similar things. But over time, I think we also evolved in a more pragmatic way. Today, we are very flexible. P- teams choose their own technology, what they are familiar with, uh, what makes sense uh, based on the context. As you said, it depends. And then uh, they choose the, the technology that, that's best for the product, but being mindful of delivering quickly and launching as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'm going to tell you just, again, one interesting story where I was working on, on this a uh, really big application for uh, fishermen, for for fishermen called, called like Fishbrain in Stockholm. You know, we had a really really strong team technically, and um, I mean, we were. If you were looking at our GitHub uh, repository, you would see that we were using like literally pretty much everything that is out there. We had no JS, Golang, PHP, whatever. You know, all kinds of stuff. So I mean, it was pretty crazy and. You know, sometimes you find these cases where people use pretty much everything because they want to experiment with various technology, or you find cases where people try to blueprint things and then they say, yeah, let's just use Node.js every time, you know. But what you eventually run into when you're building bigger systems is that some some technologies are not going to be able to to execute on some specific tasks because yeah. not that technology is good for everything, as you said. Yeah, and you, you, uh, what I, what I usually also say is, uh, look at the kind of thing that you need to build, and then pick your technology that uh, that has uh, has something to do with that, right? For example, uh, in our project that, that I'm I'm uh, still part of right now, uh, we said like, okay, we're going to use Java for the kind of backend, and we use Vue on the front end, for example. So, so that's that's kind of our kind of stack, and then. 
we see like okay th these are there are some things that we can just use some kind of services that we use from aws for example that you can just build in and as you said if you have a time constraint that's even better because then you need to don't need to build everything right don't don't build everything uh, into your system if you don't need to if you can just use something from off the shelf so those are some of the the things that i've i've seen like when you're thinking about this this kind of thing like the technology and stuff like that don't just focus on that right it, uh, focus on the problem Problem that you want to solve uh, i think that's a that's a good way to to end that one off uh so wh what is your advice on uh, finding developers and bringing them on board to your idea uh, at what stage would you, would this be done and when for example when the uh, di design prototype is ready uh, how do you how do you feel about this one yeah i can open this up so i think <laughs> we've been uh, um, i think i think what we also advise that the startups that we work with the founders is don't over hire uh, and don't hire people too quickly, so hire when it's painful. Um, and I think it's very important. It's a principle that is hard to apply. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think that, that I mean, if you think about early stage companies, uh, the biggest cost you have initially are developers and designers, right? Uh, obviously you have also marketing costs and your own salary if you have any, et cetera. And then maybe other costs like fixed costs, rent, or other stuff. But uh, the biggest cost is probably um, the cost of the product team uh, that is developing, designing, and developing the product. And uh, then being very mindful again on the constraints uh, is, is very important. And like making sure that you are not hiring people uh, too quickly because uh, the burn rate or the fixed costs are what kills companies. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's very very important to keep the team uh, at, the, at the minimum size the company can operate in, uh, and uh, and then and then yeah. So the the question mentioned this what maybe hire people when the design prototype is ready definitely makes sense. So like postpone hiring any role. So if you have a for example if you start with a designer, and then you are putting together your design prototype. Maybe you can pre-validate that design prototype with real customers, and then yep. maybe iterate on the design prototype, which is much cheaper than building code. And then uh, when you are ready to really like when you have a good clickable prototype, then you hire developers to actually work on, on, on the code. Yes, yeah, so people, people even get funding based on some people even yeah, you can absolutely. Even get yeah. Design prototype, and I think, and especially if you understand the validation process and how to do user research. How to talk to customers? You can show the prototype. You can put real data into the prototype. You have a lot of tools like Framer and Figma, and <clears throat> which are very advanced nowadays. So you can use these tools to your leverage. And uh, yeah, design is cheaper than development. And then, uh, what is your adv advice on finding developers to bring on board? I think again, if you are a developer, then probably you can easily find developers, your own friends uh, that you worked with. Uh, you know, people meetups. Like meetups uh, where you can get to know others. Yeah, but if you are if you are not a developer, then it's a bit harder. Uh, obviously, again, get immersed into a community, into a meetup, into a conference. Um, again, I think I think also that uh, you know, like that's also how we work with some clients. I mean, like finding a consultancy is not a bad idea because sometimes uh, you learn a lot by working with people that have experience building products. Uh, and then, uh, you know, like you can find consultants, you can find also freelancers. So there are many ways to assemble your team. But again, make sure that you calculate the blended cost of hiring people. So hiring somebody is very expensive. And think about all the costs, not only the salary, not only the bonuses. Uh, do you need to give equity to people? Do you need to, what do you need to pay like rent and other costs like to, to, to be able to equipment, et cetera. So hiring is very expensive. So postpone hiring as much as possible until it's painful yeah and what we forgot is that like the absolute best way to hire like early employees in any startup is by uh, giving them like a, pie, a piece of the pie right so so you want to give them a bit of equity or a bit of ownership in the startup right and that's if you find people that are going to work with you on an idea uh, in that in that way, uh, those people are going to be especially motivated to stay with you in the long run, right? And maybe even a combination of a little bit of equity, a little bit of uh, of cash, or um, but but yeah, I mean there are many ways. I think um, also different markets have different problems. 
in, in, in many markets that are saturated with a lot of uh, products and tech companies. Let's say you are in Stockholm or in London or in Berlin. Sometimes it's harder there to find, let's say, developers compared to being in Belgrade, right, or Sarajevo. But uh, but there um, you can maybe find people that understand the startup culture better and that are going to work even for free if you give them uh, a big enough part of your company. Mm. So we're going to partner up with you basically for free. Uh, where whereas in some other places uh, like um, like let's say underdeveloped startup markets uh, like the cities where I mentioned, uh, you know, people are willing to work more for money, not necessarily for equity because they don't still under don't understand maybe the concept of equity on the exits and how much money you can make based on that. So you still need to pay the rent, et cetera. And maybe they want like a uh, more tangible, tangible asset at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, we're at the one hour mark, but I don't know if you guys have any more time left. But we can, uh, I, from my part, we can uh, we can move on even uh, after this. But I don't know how you are with your time. But let's continue. Let's continue. Uh, I would also like to, to to add more more you know, an angle to this question. Sure. I, think, I think it's really interesting because assembling the team is actually a big big problem, and uh, I think I think that people really like. Uh, underestimate the cost of recruitment, finding how to find people, how to scale teams. Um, uh, this is this is another question that we have, so uh, we can uh, we can uh, get that uh, get that in there as well. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And also, one more point: the thing is churn, because I mean, you can find good people. Yep. There's yep. fluctuation in terms of uh, in terms of the of your, your team. I mean, like for example, uh, we know examples of companies in Stockholm that were built. And they hired, I don't know, 10 people. But then Spotify came in and hired all of, all of, all of their people overnight. And, uh, and I think or Google or these big companies are just aggressive in terms of acquiring new teams and uh, you know, uh, recruitment. So I think it's, uh, it's very hard. And uh, how do, that will connect to this question, how do you motivate developers to provide top quality work? Yeah, so how do you motivate them? I think, uh, I mean, the approach that we are taking uh, inside um, Ministry of Programming is uh, how we motivate our employees is that uh, we, we treat them as human beings before all. And what that means is that you take like uh, a non-scalable approach or let's say they, they, they call it doing things that, uh, doing things that don't scale. Uh, so, so basically you treat people as, as human beings, you, you, you know what they need, you try to, uh, to talk as much as possible, to, you know, to have regular development talks, uh, you know, to kind of to, to address even, let's say, even private and all kinds of business needs. So you try to be accessible and, you know, we motivate people by, by doing a lot of that. But also as well, of course, uh, offering top-notch stuff to work on that motivates engineers a lot. So they want the freedom to, uh, to work on, on really cool things, on cool technology and to advance. And if, if you don't offer people a chance to advance and if you offer them opinions straight away and you tell them yeah you're gonna do this you're gonna do that uh, you, and you don't let them build that bridge that you need or you tell them how to build it uh, then then usually that doesn't turn out very well so the best thing is to let people do their work and to respect uh, their excellence and their knowledge and then you just kind of you just consult them and you let them evolve but yeah. also I need to ping pong a little bit uh, also, like you have this concept of immersion, and one thing that we did really well in uh, Ministry of Programming is that we hired a really good team initially, and uh, this is very often underestimated. People hire uh, junior, let's say, junior developers or people from the university. I mean, that's great and it works, but then over time, uh, if you assemble a team that's not really experienced, you're gonna have a problem because people are, are motivated to work with great people. Uh, and then, uh, and then maybe you can still pull it off if people are really adaptable. They learn fast, and then they become the best version of themselves really quickly. Uh, but what we figured is that you know you always need to have a core team that's really inspiring, that's like great engineers, great designers, great product managers, uh, people that really like inspire other people to become better. And then I think it's it's a big boost. It's immersion. In action. Yeah, we recently like had a startup that literally failed just for one reason. I mean, we had like a stellar lineup 
uh, in the whole team, but it failed just because one of the uh, product managers on board uh, was not maybe like with his people and soft skills, he was not maybe good enough mm. with, uh, like how to exit from a hearing situation inside the team. Yeah. And as far as said, you know, like the people skills, the soft skills, that's really, really important in the beginning. And if you, if you find like some, um, some people that don't respect others that are going to be like, try to be like a boss inside a team of five or four people, you know, that's not going to work, right? Yeah. Like very democratic, dem democratic individuals that are going to work together, that are going to find some solutions for tough problems in the beginning and also in the evolution of the startup. And later when you have 50 people, 100, 200, then of course, uh, those, let's say, uh, bad individuals are not going to be so prominent. But in the beginning, it's really important that you nail the hiring and that you find people that are similar to you and that share your values. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. I mean, when I when I look at uh, developers, I, I've said this a few times, I think also on the podcast that I do, uh, I, I I usually do a kind of 80-20 thing uh, where I do like 80% 80 80 is like, is like really looking at the person itself right looking at the person how are they uh, what kind of person are they uh, do they have a passion for this do they want to uh, work in this in this particular field uh, i think that's more and of course communication and uh, being able to communicate is one really big thing uh, but if 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 that works all the other stuff like the if they if you if you see that they have this eagerness to learn uh, the other things can be learned right the hard skills can be learned pretty easily uh, but the soft skills are harder to do and then to this question i mean it's all about trust so it, it's all about being able to say to someone for example if you have a team uh, of four or five developers, you have a senior developer that kind of has that software, software architect kind of role in, in there. Uh, you just pose the question, right? We're going to build this. What are some of the things that you can think of that can maybe solve this problem in the technology way or, or whatever? Because when they do that, when they uh, deliver that input, you're basically saying like, I trust you like 100%. Uh, if you say this is the right option, uh, then we can spar a little bit about it like okay why do you think uh, that is the best option and then go from there and say like okay this is uh, th this is going to be the actual solution and then that's how you build that trust right that's how you especially w for example if i take an example of i'm working with developers i'm going to say like okay you're you guys are going to work with this technology right you're going to be able you're going to work on it with the daily on a daily basis you're going to use this particular technology framework or whatever you're going to do that every day so uh, who am i to tell you what you're going to use right i mean does, yeah. doesn't doesn't really make sense yeah exactly and, and the, the funny thing also that is starting from uh, from your let's say values and also from from the values uh, and, and history you know, and everything else of the environment where we live in is that let's say in, in some parts of, uh, of the world like maybe even Eastern Europe or right, Yugoslavia uh, many times people are used to this more like command structure where, uh, yeah. where you have you know the big boss that is telling you what to do and then people get stuck because you know they're like oh my god now what should I do if I don't have a task you know I mean you, you have not created by a gyro story on or I don't have the specification and stuff like that. But those are really smart people. But the problem is that, you know, their whole life, they have been working in a certain manner. And, you know, they have been used to this more like, let's say, corporate structures uh, by having Absolutely. Like, the outsourcing industry or being in corporations. And then maybe they have never had the chance uh, to, to express that creativity. So when you, when you get into the startup world, you realize that it's not anymore about you know, getting everything, uh, everything on the table, right? So nobody is gonna bring everything there and tell you, hey, you should do this, whatever. Then you, you need to fight. You need to talk to the people. You need to find the solutions, be, be, be technical or business solutions. Yeah. And I think people are really motivated. I mean, like you, you mentioned trust. I think trust is really essential in that regard because you need to give people space to be autonomous. And then when people are autonomous, when they suggest their own solutions, when they create, I think that's when they, they perform at their best. That's when they're Absolutely. more happy. And I think uh, autonomy is extremely important, you know, but it, it doesn't work without trust. And uh, I think also what we mentioned before, immersion, working with great people, many other things. I think it's what we learned, uh, we're very humble when we think about 
HR, let's call it like that, even though we call it people operations. When yeah. we talk about people operations or HR, you need to be very humble because the psychology and sociology of all of these fields are extremely complex. And, uh, you know, and it's, maybe it's even more complicated than development because it gets into the topics of the brain and how people behave, et cetera. And then I think, I think when you really, like, dig into it, you are very humble and you start learning. And that, then I would encourage every founder to really read a lot about, let's call it HR, even though I don't like the name, uh, about yeah. HR, about psychology, about sociology, game theory, all of these things that can help you understand how people behave. Yeah, and I think this uh, this question is a is a good one as well. This comes back to uh, the hiring in the in the beginning, I think. Uh, so, what about co cooperating with freelancers for the first and second year to avoid hiring, uh, for example, with a data engineer or something uh, similar? Yeah, I mean, this can be tricky, right? So, so as we said, um, having freelancers or consultants aboard, some people will just hate it because of some previous experiences uh, having teams of developers in uh, Eastern Europe or India or Egypt or wherever, right? And uh, I mean, the thing is, not all companies that are operating uh, in the outsourcing industry or that are not all freelancers are the same, right? So, yep. so the question is now, how do you find uh, the best freelancers? That's the hard question. And I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but the thing is, I mean, you can definitely find uh, some some good companies uh, that that provide consulting services. And as I said, they not all the companies in a region are the same. So, so if somebody that told you, I don't know, I have been working with this company in Vietnam, and it was a really bad experience for me, that doesn't necessarily mean mean that that's the case. Because, for example, we for a fact know a couple of really good companies in Vietnam, but. Uh, in terms of freelancers, it gets a bit tougher because then you need to go on the, let's say, on the unit level of, of, of a person that is really good and to find that person. And, uh, and then there is like a whole range of complexities that you can get into. But in terms yeah. of operating with, uh, in, in the beginning with freelancers, I think it's, it's a good option if you are able to spot what is what? What is a good freelancer? Yeah, and I think I think it's. Uh, I mean, to give a larger perspective on this, um, today we talk about remote work and uh, the new trends of working, right? And then you have two camps of people: people that believe that startups should be created only by a team that sits in the same place, and uh, like we do, and you know, we don't really believe in social distancing because we're twins. Uh, <laughs> I think like you have people that believe that the team should sit in the same place, maybe by the same table and code all night and all the weekend. Uh, and then you have another camp that says, ah, that doesn't really matter. What matters is building a team of people that really believes in the mission and the culture uh, that we are creating. And then all that matters are results. And then, I mean, it's just like, you know, very philosophical, religious to some degree. But what I believe is that uh, remote work is here to stay. And even big companies, big startups, and uh, you know, small startups are realizing that uh, geographical distribution is the new norm. And then it doesn't really matter. I mean, like uh, for me, I mean, honestly, when, when I think about recruitment, if I was running my, my startup today, a new startup, I would think about okay, options. Option A is hire a local person in my city. That's nice. Option B is a freelancer. Option C is a consultancy. It doesn't really matter. It's about, as Rashad said, it's about finding the right people to work with. And then about it's about cost benefit. Because in the end, uh, sometimes hiring an internal person is more expensive than hiring a freelancer or vice versa. Uh, and then uh, it's about cost efficiency. Uh, and then it's, but most importantly, it's, it's about culture. It's about uh, many, many different aspects. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you need to find the best people wherever you can find them. I think yeah. and it doesn't really matter where they are. Yeah, yeah. There's a sure. topic called exponential organizations. I always recommend it. like that. That is uh, describing how uh, these exponential comp growing companies have been built by leveraging uh, teams in different uh, areas of the world. So yeah. this is in line with this. I mean, it's definitely it's definitely possible and definitely the best approach right now. Because if you are in Zurich or if you are in Berlin or Stockholm or London, you have a huge issue hiring. Uh, for sure, 
And then there are better people elsewhere than the ones that you can find in that market. And we're not saying that, you know, people in Serbia or Croatia or Bosnia are better than people in Berlin or in Stockholm. That's not always the case. I mean, there are good people everywhere, but uh, the thing is, what, who are the people that you, you can hire? So that's, that's the question. And yeah. that's, the tough, that's the tough problem that most companies are facing. Yeah, I have one more question in the technology department, uh, and it's about uh, Blazor. I have never heard of it, to be honest, but it could be that it's really new in that sense. But uh, have you guys ever heard of it? Uh, no, honestly, no. I mean, like, uh, I'm really like uh, researching a lot uh, technology, uh, and I mean, I never heard about Blazor. Um, I mean, I kind of it kind of rings in my mind, but I'm not going to pretend I know what it is. <laughs> I don't know either. We generally use Microsoft a lot for um, for one simple reason. We use mostly open source because uh, people don't want to mess with licensing uh, and they want to use free and open, yeah. open software. And uh, I mean, of course, Microsoft has evolved uh, through the years into, into a much more open company as well. And there are good solutions there as well. But we don't generally you I mean we personally right now we we, we don't use my Microsoft solutions too much. I mean we yeah. use the .NET Core on one startup and uh, also Microsoft Azure as a cloud uh, provider on, on a few startups. But uh, I think overall, uh, I mean for some reason Microsoft I mean not for some reason but what Rashad described made Microsoft very un unpopular uh, back in the days uh, in the startup communities. Uh, but I think, yeah, that's changing definitely. I think, I mean, one of the good things is, I mean, like my perception, Microsoft changed when they started adopting things like Node.js. I mean, before that, they even built some stuff on the CLR, like, uh, I mean, they ported Python and some technologies on the CLR, but with yeah. Node.js, I think they stepped into like, you know, supporting real open source. And over the years, I think they did things like TypeScript and many good stuff that is really, uh, evolving the perception, dot dot net core, etc. So uh, I mean, I never heard about Blazor, so I would love to get to know. We have more. to look at. We have to look at that. I mean, it could be that it's also an open source uh, framework, of course. So uh, we can we can definitely have a look at that. But I I agree. I mean, the Microsoft thing. Uh, I think it started with when Satya Nadella uh, kind of took over as CEO that they kind of went into a different direction and uh, adopted more kind of open source and stuff like that. So I, it's it's good to see that cultural, cultural like uh, lens. Yeah. Yeah, inside the company and, and yeah. just like becoming more similar to, to the companies that we love. And uh, I mean, and just to, to, to not to not come like uh, in a wrong in a wrong manner. I mean, we have been .NET developers for years before, but we just dropped it at some point because in the startup world, you very seldom run into Microsoft solutions. Yeah, that's true. The uh, practical reason is, I mean, like I'm going to give you my experience working with C-sharp for eight years. But then uh, when, when I started working on new products, I was really frustrated with the fact that back in the days, I couldn't really get deep into the technology, into the tech stack. Uh, like, for example, I couldn't really understand how the DLLs, uh, the .NET framework operate on the operating system level. And then what, what, that, that was one of the reasons that made me adopt uh, open source, because I could really get into every detail in Linux and understand how every bit of technology works. Uh, and kind of, uh, to me, I mean, that was like really important. Uh, I guess a lot of people don't have that problem. They work with things like, I don't know, React, et cetera. But when you start working on the back end on really complex uh, technologies, then these kind of things become really important. I'm not saying Microsoft is not going there. Definitely it's going there. But back in the days, it wasn't like that. And then uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't a good environment for startups. But I think... We're pretty open to any technology. I mean, we're a technology agnostic in the company. Uh, as I said, I mean, we don't really care about what people are going to use in a product as long as they're familiar with it, as long yeah. as it makes sense in terms of the requirements itself and what needs to be built. And then, yeah, just go and, you know, just do it. And then also the cost structure is important. Uh, hopefully, you know, there are not like significant licensing costs or any costs that could really like increase the burn rate significantly and I think that's that's really important for startups. Yeah, because I mean, I remember like, like in the beginning when we were developing some of the first startups, uh, I think uh, we had like uh, a consultant that, that in one of the startups we had like an external consultant from 
from Moldova that uh, chose to, to build like a database on Oracle. And then at that time, nobody was looking like into licenses. We were too busy building things. And then, you know, very soon somebody figured out, you know, oh my God, you know, now we need to pay for this license. We don't have the money, you know, what, what are we gonna do? And basically we just kind of swapped the whole Oracle database into Postgres SQL, which was, is free, it's still, right? And like, it's an open source technology. And, and, you know, this is an example where, you know, people just, even if they smell licensing or additional cost in startups, they're gonna run away from it, even if it's not, even if it's <laughs> the case. Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. So I have two more topics that I want to get into real quickly. Uh, so what makes a startup successful is a, is a question that a lot of people will ask. Uh, one thing that it doesn't make it successful, I think, is technology. <laughs> it does it does help, but it's not uh, it's not a, a factor, right? In the sense of, um, if you have a new bleeding edge te technology, that doesn't mean your startup is going to succeed in that sense. I mean, like for example, people like Paul Graham. I mean, they were writing about this idea that if you use uh, a more interesting or exotic technology, then you are more likely to succeed. And I think that was maybe true before. Uh, but today, I mean, the, the technologies are, have evolved so much that today technology is definitely not a big contributor to success. Uh, I mean, the IP, the code that you write, is uh, the business logic, the algorithms are more important than the technology itself. Uh, I think that, that and, and of course, if you have bad programmers, that could really slow down your progress. But technology is not going to kill your startup. I mean, usually. I mean, I've seen... I've seen startups that were killed by technology, but that's only because the programmers were so lazy and they were so bad that they coded like a really uh, like a monster. And I think I mean, but that doesn't happen very often. But I mean, for definitely the, the biggest problem that doesn't make startups successful is not having product market fit. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, the the biggest number of failed startups that we have been part of or that we have been in contact with are the ones that have a found product market fit. And what is product market fit is basically to find like um, to find uh, like that, let's say, killer feature inside your app that people need, that people are going to use, right? So basically to find that the value, right? Because uh, I don't know, you might be building again uh, an app for uh, car enthusiasts, but when people download your app, then they don't understand, you know, maybe what is the value for them or uh, what kind of how they can use the app so so you know you, you need to find you need to bring that value to the customer so that's you need to find the product market fit and that's 90 i think that at least 90 percent of the startups fail because of not finding actually you know what is the silver lining what is the yeah and, and also like if you see the list of uh, reasons why startups fail very often you're going to see fundraising or funding or uh, you know uh, we didn't have money for marketing or i mean some some reason like that but it always boils down to product market fit because how I think about startups is that is the iterations. And then uh, if you have enough money over time and uh, sufficient luck, then you're gonna iterate to success. And maybe version 175 of your startup is gonna be like a blowout success. And then uh, you need to really think about cash, how to preserve money. This is why I, I was, again, I repeat the same idea constrain yourself to small releases, small iterations, six weeks, then six weeks again, then six weeks again. Don't build big features, big releases, you know, big, I don't know, whatever, just adding stuff into your product. Try to be very pragmatic, very lean, launch quickly, and then that also preserves cash. And then uh, that enables you to iterate one more time, which might be the difference between success and failure, because that that might hit product market fit. Yeah. Um, I think I think also when we talk about product market fit, it's not only about I mean there's also problem solution fit before product market fit, which means understanding your customer. I mean it's surprising how many startups that are that are also decently successful. I mean on on the surface, for example, that have funding, don't really understand their customers. I mean we we are we're building one startup. I'm not going to name it, but uh, it's decently successful. I mean <laughs> it's uh, one of the, actually one of uh, even one of the market leaders in its field in the northern europe but the problem is that the whole company when we joined i mean the, the few people that were in the company the, the founders and the, the board they didn't really understand who was the customer and then i remember these conversations where people would call me and explain me okay man look our customer is a high paying person that uh, has a lot of money and it's like a 
higher class individual. You know, I mean, they were describing the customer to me, but then when, when we started talking to customers doing user research, we discovered, I mean, that, I mean, these people have no idea who, who are their customers. Nobody's talking to the customer. And I think that is also one of the contributors to lack of pro market fit. Uh, there is not a conversation between the founders and the team and the customers on a daily, weekly, monthly level. And I think, I think that that's, that's really underappreciated. And uh, it's not only when you build your first MVP, but it's a continuous two-way conversation with customers. And uh, very, yeah. most people fail at that miserably. So, so, so in the beginning, like it's to put it very easy, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can figure out uh, how somebody is, is, is going to do just by asking them a very simple question. If somebody comes to you and tells you, hey, I have this great idea, you know, I think this is going to kill it, you know, I'm going to sell uh, like, uh, I don't know, 100,000 this year or whatever. And then uh, they tell you what the idea is about, you know, and then uh, the question that you need to ask is actually, okay, how many people have you talked with uh, besides yourself and your friends and family circle? Uh, how many people have you talked with and how many people are willing to, uh, pay for your for 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 that service, you know. And then, yeah. let's say in ninety nine percent of the cases, uh, founders have not talked with anyone else except their friends and family. Service. In their head, <laughs> or, or, or their head, maybe a duck, maybe, maybe a duck. But but <laughs> so then you know, everybody are kind of telling me, yeah, man, this is a great idea. You should do it. You know, I love it. You know. But then when you ask, okay, uh, do you want to do like? A, like a, like a like a purchase or or like a like a like an order uh, upfront before actually I get into building this or do you want to make a, a monetary contribution or to pay something to help me with this or just to buy a pair of something that I'm selling you know if you ask that question then uh, people are gonna back off no whoa you know yeah I just told you it's a good idea but I don't want to give you like five euros right so <laughs> so I'm sorry you know but I mean. When you build it, let me know. So yeah. that tells you usually that people are just bullshitting you and that they just want you to make, make you feel good because they are your friends. So that's a really bad idea to actually ask your friends and your family about an idea because everybody's going to tell you it's really amazing. Yeah. And then, I mean, we also failed a lot. I mean, obviously, like we built some very successful startups in Ministry of Programming uh, that are like worth 100 million you know, or more. But we failed a lot. And also, like, one example of why startups fail or why they succeed is also the mentality and the attitude of the co-founding team. I mean, do you have, like, a long-term outlook? Uh, do you really, are you really ready to die, literally, in the trenches for 5, 10, 15 years? Do you have the focus, the persistence, the adaptability needed to survive in the market, to iterate 100 times? And, for example, I remember we, <laughs> we co-founded one startup in Germany, uh, like, a few years ago. And uh, I remember literally it was a really good idea. We had a great team, great marketing approach, uh, access to some special, like, you know, special resources, which gives us competitive advantages. All the boxes were checked. And then we really underestimated that, like, you know, some, we, like one of our co-founders was not really like super motivated. And then after, I don't know, a few months, he, it was his first startup and he literally called me and he said, man, I'm really tired, you know, I want to exit as soon as possible. Uh, you yeah. know, I really cannot do this anymore. I want to retire with my family, go to a beach. And then he was asking me questions, okay, when are we gonna sell this company? And then, I mean, like, I felt like, what the fuck, I mean, we just started. Yeah. We we're gonna exit maybe in 10 years. Yeah. How yeah, exactly. to tell that to your co-founder then, and then you know it's gonna fail because uh, if people don't have this mindset of like, you know, Maybe you're gonna lose money. I mean, there was this startup in Bosnia, a really successful company. Uh, the founders, like literally, were losing money for seven years, seven years, and then, like literally, they made nothing. They could work in any for any other company, making more money. And then, after seven years, they hit multi-million revenue, and now they're like very wealthy people. And uh, yeah. this is an, this is the usual path of startups. I mean, people yeah. look at Facebook or Instagram, or whatever. But these are not good examples. These are outliers. Good startups succeed over a long period of time. So what makes startups successful is this long-term mindset, working with people that have a long-term mindset as well and uh, that are going to iterate with you 100 times, 200 times, 500 times. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm this question from Harris, Harris, which is like, uh, which is in yeah. line 
With this. Yeah, I, I, I'm just looking for it. Which one was it? Uh, yeah. So the I, I'll let's do uh, let's do a lightning round because there are a lot of uh, a lot of questions that I didn't uh, put in there. So let's let's do a, a quick lightning round about some uh, some questions that were asked. So uh, do you think Scandinavia is a good place to have HQ for a developer company? Well, I think you guys can actually answer that. Yeah, let's we'll just go for quick answers. So yeah, it's it's a great place uh, because of both the. Um, legislative frameworks that are uh, that are set up there of availability of capital, of talent. Uh, of the, it's a very developed ecosystem. So the answer is Scandinavia. Yes. <laughs> How for, uh, for for starting companies? Very cool. Uh, do Bosnian startups make efficient use of the EU, EU US, and other available free funds? Uh, definitely no, because I think I mean one of the reasons is that it's very hard to apply for these funds. I mean, I have a friend in Belgrade uh, that is a specialist in these kind of things. And I know how hard it is to write these applications. It's almost like a mini specialization of some sort. And uh, I think, I mean, there is a lot of opportunity for these funds, but yeah, no. Yeah. Yes. Um, and let's see this one. Uh, what are the top technologies you use in your company? Have you ever used Go? Uh, yeah, yeah we, use, we use Go and quite a lot of actually uh, replaced Node.js in our technology stack for, for most cases, and we find it very uh, easy to work with and very efficient as well for, um, especially, of course, like, let's say, some specific tasks like processing on the back end and stuff like that. So so it's one of the main technologies that we use. Yeah. Uh, not a question, but it's cool to see a heart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is a good way to get user feedback once the product service is live? This is also a very yeah, good question. I've been writing a set of articles on this topic. Uh, how to yeah, launch. let's link that. Yeah, let's link that when that's done. Uh, I mean, some good ways are, for example, product hunt. Um, good ways to, to get feedback also are immersing into communities like uh, Facebook, you know, groups. Facebook groups, Quora, uh, Reddit. Uh, but also offline, I mean, meetups, you know, or places where your customers linger, where they hang out. You go to a place where is your, where is your customer. For example, if you're developing a medical product, you go to a conference where doctors are hanging out and then like show the product to doctors, uh, get feedback. And I think it's, I mean, that kind of mentality, really simple things. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that, that's a quick answer. All right, and uh, success versus failure rate in your startups, and uh, also the governance model. I, people are yeah. interested. Uh, yeah, I think. I, I think. I mean, the answer is obvious, right? So our failure rate is pretty high, and uh, that's that's what everybody is going to tell you in the in the startup community. We have experienced this on, on our own as well. Uh, also, let's say we have invested in uh, in eight companies so far. Um, we um, inside Ministry of Programming. Um, so those companies were located located in different um, parts of the world. Um, most of them were in Scandinavia, but also we invested also, let's say, in Germany and other places. And um, yeah, I mean, we failed with most of them very miserably. Like a couple of them uh, are really doing well. Uh, so we managed, let's say, to build um, some pretty cool companies with uh, multi-million dollar valuations from scratch. With uh, by investing uh, in them and building stuff together with those co-founders, and uh, yeah, I mean the, the failure rate is huge. And uh, you know, uh, at some point when you figure out how much money have you burned, and uh, that uh, you know that you should be better off like just doing consulting or doing something like more easy, uh, then uh, it truly really gets hard on people. And that, that's why the startup world is so interesting because uh, you are fighting against all odds. Uh, you are not taking, you know, the salary uh, for working at a big company. You're trying to build something yourself. Uh, not eating so well in some fancy restaurants. Not buying the car you want or whatever. Uh, so you need maybe to, to invest some of your money inside. So it's it's really tough. Uh, and uh, on the govern governance model, maybe Faris can comment. Uh, I mean, I don't know specifically what what, what is the question uh, about governance model. I, I think it's I think it's how you kind of invest in companies or how you help them out. I think that that's kind of the thing, right? Uh, how do you uh, do you take equity? Do you uh, how do you help uh, these startups out? So, so we have two model. We have two main models. One is uh, one is the, 
what is like a very niche service where we work as, as uh, consultants optimized for early stage startups, which means that we're not, you know, I mean, we're not like the typical consultancy that's going to rip off a founder, et cetera. So we're actually trying to work with the company to build a long-term business, um, a long-term successful business. So it's very tweaked uh, to, to, so we work in that, uh, in that kind of model. Uh, and then the other model is that we are the first investor in the company. As a pre-seed investor, we invest, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, 150,000 in a company for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20%. And then we assemble a full product team, which means designers, developers, product managers, everything. And then we, we get in the board of the company usually, and then we work on strategy together. We end up we, we, with both models. What we do is also that we're like a mentorship structure we are uh, also a, some sort of mini light accelerator. We, and then we, what we do is that we are trying to solve this problem of product market fit together, of fundraising together, recruitment on-site, off-site together. And then we just like work long-term with companies to uh, enable success. And uh, you know, I think our track record speaks for itself. Uh, we built very successful companies using these models. And they don't really differ too much because we behave the same. We serve the founders. We really like believe in, uh, in very in adaptability. For example, if companies don't have money at some point, maybe maybe we got uh, we get into a consulting model with the company, but then they don't have money to pay us. Then no problem. We're going to invest in a company. We're going to loan money, and everything in the service of our mission, which is building successful companies long term and helping entrepreneurs succeed. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, there's some MOP love that I just want to show, uh, and <laughs> and you are great. So we're, I think we can uh, we can pretty much end it there. Uh, of course, uh, you guys, uh, very thank you so much for all the time you've uh, yeah, you've spent. We, we, but, uh... Yeah, <laughs> probably with all the questions and all the interesting topics that there are, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's been a great uh, live bets live session. Uh, of course, you can find uh, everything about the uh, Ministry of Programming on ministryofprogramming.com. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, again, uh, thanks, guys. It was uh, it was great talking to you. Uh, and uh, of course, we're going to share this. Uh, people that are all watching on uh, YouTube, subscribe. Uh, there's many more coming. And uh, guys, there's one one thing. Yeah, go ahead. If you really believe in continuous feedback, please share your feedback. Yeah, absolutely. We, I mean, if we said something wrong, feel free to call us out on social media. We're going to be able. To have a nice conversation you can find us on linkedin on facebook on many platforms on instagram so we're very open i mean just tell us i mean you are you are like you said this it's not it's not true blah blah, blah. i mean or i like this i didn't like that so just like i mean tell us what you think and we're happy to discuss and talk i know. think these are the twi twitter twitter handles right am i am i right yeah and uh, and you know people sometimes are, are like like they, they don't they don't believe how open we are. So whatever you ask us, we're gonna we're gonna answer. We don't see ourselves as like something special. Or I mean, we, we, we are successful, but we're also humble because we fail a lot, and uh, you know we are ready to answer any questions or, or to learn to learn from you guys as well. Yeah, there were a lot of great questions. Uh, I think uh, that was uh, that was cool to see. And Haris uh, also said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, very cool uh, guys thanks a lot for your time uh, and uh, until next time for for everybody that's watching bye bye thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting us see you no guys. problem bye bye